Hey guys, Kevin Atwell here for Close Look. Thanks for tuning in. It is the new year. I'm sitting here with uh, Sergeant Mark and Constable Cal. I'm here, really excited to hear their story. So let's take a close look. How are you guys doing? Doing well, Kevin. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, excellent. I'm glad to be here. So I'm so curious about this project called Beat Series. Uh, please tell us a little bit about it, how it came to be, and your role in it specifically. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I was involved in the second season as a constable and as an acting sergeant on the show. Uh, once again, the show is in its second season. It's known as The Beat. And it's the reason why it's called The Beat is because the primary focus of the show is to uh, concentrate on the beat enforcement teams down here in the downtown east side of Vancouver, considered one of the more violent neighborhoods in all of North America. It's got a lot of challenges. And uh, however, it's got a massive drug addiction issue as well, which is uh, also one of the primary focuses of the show and all essentially demonstrate and exemplifies how being good officers we deal with these individuals on the street with a level of compassion and empathy and the role that you play my name is mark steinkamp i'm a i'm a sergeant in the uh, downtown east side and i've i've uh, spent about 14 years of my 22 years of uh, experience in the vancouver police department patrolling the streets here uh i was uh uh, I was challenged a few years ago, along with uh, one of the other sergeants, Toby Hinton, to take on uh, a, a project uh, that we were offered to uh, allow uh, Gala Films from Montreal to basically uh, ride on our shoulders to uh, to, uh, to uh, come and watch uh, us and the other beat officers work in, uh, in the downtown east side, to watch us uh, to interact and enforce uh, the laws and to be compassionate and and to watch uh, people sink to their lowest lows and and help some of those people to get out of this uh, this uh, this active addiction, we uh, w we've had the opportunity and sometimes we might get a little um, uh, jaded or or get a little thick skinned from the things that we see, but uh, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the impact and a lot of the feedback that uh, uh, we've received is is all positive. Uh, for uh, for people that have seen uh, episodes of the beat, the first series that was broadcast in 2008, and uh, this latest series that uh, that is uh, on City TV right now, uh, is all positive. It 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 shows the deep darkest realities of of people with uh, uncontrolled mental health issues and uh, horrible horrible drug addictions and and people who end up in places like like the downtown east side in Vancouver. I've um, uh, I've traveled extensively across Canada, and I've uh, uh, each of the communities, whether it's uh, a few thousand people or big cities like Vancouver, and they've all got their uh, addiction issues, and they've all got their mental health issues, and they've all got their their street their street scene. But uh, uh, the opportunity uh, that uh, the public gets to see Vancouver's uh, downtown east side is is unparalleled anywhere. There's a uh, I've uh, I've escorted people from around the world, police officers, politicians, uh, um, uh, um, powerful people, and uh, they all have uh, <laughs> the same comments. Uh, why is this allowed? Why is uh, why is this not? Uh, why are these people not being, being helped more than they are? And it's it's a really hard hard to, uh, a question to answer, but the opportunity that the public can get is to see how far um, bad choices when it comes to being involved in drugs can lead them. You know, it, uh, we talk to, uh, uh, have talked to thousands and thousands of people in this, uh, in this area and they, uh, almost to a person, they've all started when they were young, teenagers, 12, 13, 14 years old, drinking and smoking pot. And, uh, and I'm not saying if you have a few drinks or smoke uh, smoke pot when you're a kid, you're going to end up smoking crack or, or heroin. But uh, I don't know anybody who didn't start that way. And uh, and uh, coupled with that, uh, you know, several thousand people with mental health issues thrust into this area. And uh, it, uh, it it's a very sad area. It's a, it's a, a lot of wasted human potential here. And uh, it's uh, it's it can be a very tough area for people to understand, like those people that uh, I bring out and uh, I uh, allow them to see a part of my working world. Um, uh, the uh, the public is going to be able to see uh, where we go to work. They're basically going to come to work with us. Mm -hmm. They're going to see us dealing with these folks, um, whether we're arresting them 
or whether they're, uh, uh, they're were just uh, shaking their hand or helping them out from uh, uh, the sidewalk where they might be sitting. You know, it, uh, it's going to allow the public to see the real face of the police and the real face of uh, uh, those folks with addictions and, and mental health issues and the living space that they've got. So uh, uh, I encourage I encourage everybody to have an op uh, I encourage everybody to take half an hour out of their day when the, when the beat's on uh, to uh, to watch it come to work with uh, with Cal and me and the other beat officers. You can see uh, where people end up when uh, uh, when they take those really negative choices or they end up in places like this. Cal, so I just wanted to get your opinion and on. Why do you feel some individuals are prone to um, coming down this path? Um, what are some of the risk factors, the contributing factors? Is it communities? Is it socioeconomic class? Like from your experience in being in this career, what have you seen? And you know, Kevin, if essentially if we're going to address uh, this issue or address the question properly, then uh, I'm obviously going to allude back to what Sergeant Mark Steinkamp had to say as well. However, I mean, if we're going to start looking at uh, psychological um, theories with respect to nature versus nurture or sociological theories, uh, somebody's socioeconomic backgrounds, yeah, those are all valid factors uh, or ver valid variables in the equation of why people end up doing what they're doing. However, I mean, if we're going to compartmentalize uh, the question and take a look at uh, the problem at its grassroots level, then keep in mind, I mean, it, these some of these individuals come from dysfunctional family environments, uh, peer pressure that they experienced uh, while going through high school or uh, going through university or the friend circle that they keep, curiosity, uh, they want to know what it's all about. And you got to keep in mind, Kevin, we all have our demons in our closets and our crosses to bear. However, when you start utilizing drugs as a mask for something to hide behind so that you don't have to think about your problem or address it, then yeah, it's going to become a very deeper issue and you're never going to be able to uh, essentially mitigate the problem by finding the proper coping mechanisms. And so that's where we come in, not only as police officers, but also as individuals who care about the community that we police. <laughs> The empathy that we show, the compassion that we show, and the resources that we have available to help these individuals, that's going to be conducive to facilitating change. I'm not suggesting that we're the final solution. I'm not suggesting that we're going to be able to make the necessary fundamental changes in the infrastructure of society to uh, eliminate drug addiction altogether. I'm not suggesting that at all. Uh, there's other resources for that. However, we're going to be part of the solution. And so when you take everything that we've learned, all the educational awareness programs that police officers are taught, uh, that's information that we can pass on forward. And we're right there on the streets every single day dealing with these individuals. So we're the front line response. And uh, in police terms, you can call it the thin blue line, right? We're there and 24-7 uh, and we're here to make a change. Wonderful. And you use the word compassion and empathy. And so it's not like you're just going out and like busting people. It's almost like a cleaning up the streets type of endeavor. Um, what are some of the resources that um, you can just kind of name off right now that you can provide these individuals? Absolutely. I mean, we're going to refer them uh, to detox centers. We're going to refer them to individuals or agencies that can provide them the ne necessary help that they need. We don't have specific programs in the Vancouver Police Department that will take these addicted individuals in and give them that the assistance they need. We provide them the information that they need to get to where they're at. But keep in mind, being a frontline response, when we see some of these individuals lying in the streets in their own, uh, I mean, in this type of environment where they're in the most visceral, raw, most fundamental uh, state of being, when we see them lying in the alleys behind dumpsters like that, we are our brother's keepers. We will lift these individuals up, we'll make sure that they get to a warm shelter, and that'll be the first step in starting them on their journey to getting better. But you're absolutely right, Kevin. It's uh, compassion and empathy are part of the tools that we use to help these type of drug addicted in, uh, individuals. But in the same vein, we are a law enforcement agency at the end of the day. So we will use our necessary policing resources, our necessary policing skills, our investigative backgrounds, as well the power that's been attributed to us by the government to make the necessary changes in this community by enforcing the law against the predatory drug dealers that make this happen in the first place. So just to add what Cal was talking about, the resources that we have on hand, it, within the last few years, uh, a lot of positive things have changed uh, in this area. 
uh, and uh, uh, for the people who used to be homeless and, and used to be addicted and used to be thrust out onto the street because of their mental health issues and really nowhere to turn to. But we would, uh, God, we, we would not know what to do because we didn't have those resources. But th there's been a, uh, a, a lot of turns to the good. There's better housing where it used to be uh, uh, a person would either be on the street or they would live in a literally a cockroach and bed bug infested uh, uh, a rooming house. Uh, now, the, the, with the federal, provincial, and city governments, they've uh, they've built places where a person has their own space. They've got their ability to to put up a TV and have a washing machine on their own, to have their own kitchen, God, have their own bathroom instead of having it to share it with 20 or 30 other people in the same predicament. But not just housing. We've also got uh, um, sex trade liaison uh, officer Linda Malcolm, who is out there reaching out and, and uh, really making a lot of broad steps towards uh, uh, towards uh, opening communication between the police and those folks. We've also we've just started out with an ACT team. It takes all the stakeholders to take some of the worst folks on the street, the worst people with uh, with mental health issues, are taking up a significant amount of police and ambulance and fire and mental health and, and hospital resources and steering them towards a healthier lifestyle. I, uh, uh, every time I go on the street, every time I'm driving uh, uh, into work, I'm looking at these folks and I'm just imagining how I would feel if my brother, or my sister, or my mom or my dad or, or any one of my loved ones was out here and how would I want them treated. I tell you, I would want them treated compassionately and respectfully. And a lot of the folks down here, they're, for whatever reason, they're not treated that way. I think that there's, uh, there's a lot of work we can do as, uh, as society as a whole, not just a police department, but society as a whole. But uh, the, uh, the efforts are, are being there. The efforts are, are out. And uh, we've got, uh, uh, in, in, even in the last 8 to 10 years, we've had uh, drug courts. And uh, for those who have, uh, uh, the drug court's actually just in the, the courtroom, the courthouse across the street. And uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm continually seeing people that I once knew as skinny, toothless, horrible looking people who've gone through that program and, you know, have been held up. And they're, you know what, they come back and they go, what the hell was I doing with my life? You know what, they knew what they were doing but they just didn't have that, maybe that hand up or that, you know, that ability to get out. And yeah, uh, 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 a place like the drug court can work. There's also the downtown community court. You know what it allows people who have got uh, uh, charges that are suitable for that type of uh, uh, setting, gives them access to all the resources that they need. Because a lot of the folks who are out there doing the shoplifting's and, uh, and uh, so-called um, uh, 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 summary conviction offenses, you know what, they've, they've, they're survival drug addicts and they they're doing everything they can to survive or they've got those very significant and very uh, horrible mental illnesses that have thrust them out onto the street so we're able to push them towards that uh, uh, those resources that are going to help them so uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of work positive work that has been done but you know I'm looking out the street and my hair's still wet I was just out on the street and I tell you it's a hell of a lot more work to be done. So uh, all it takes is uh, um, uh, all it takes is resources, and time, and effort. And there's a lot of that. There's a lot of caring and compassionate people out there, just like the police. I've I've worked in this area, like I said, most of my career, and I don't do it because uh, um, uh, I don't do it for any other reason. But I'm a compassionate person.